Welcome everybody to Fidipides TV, episode three. We've got an action-packed episode uh, with, um, we're going to be discussing some shoe reviews. We're also going to be talking to uh, two-time Olympian Alan Culpepper, as well as the Baron of Beer Miles, uh, Rob Schuler. Talk about the, the, the lore of the beer mile. Uh, so for now, or right now anyway, we're going to talk about some shoe reviews with, uh, I'm, by the way, I'm Kevin Graham, this is my colleague Greg Sheets. And we're going to be discussing um, what we call our uh, balanced or versatile uh, shoe collection. And uh, Greg Sheets, what exactly is a versatile or a balanced shoe? How do you define that? Can I say something else first before we get into Absolutely. that? Um, for our people viewing public, I have new sandals and I just <laughs> wanted to... <laughs> Uh, I'm so excited that I found some shoes that yeah. uh, that fit my foot and yeah. frame my foot. Uh, okay. Kind of a tie-in to... Uh... Can you show the camera your sandals? I mean, is that, I mean they're really, really elegant looking. They well, thank nice. you. Thank you. They're very comfortable, and that's why I always have a smile on my face. Oh, wonderful. Now, back to uh, shoes. The um, Let's also... Uh, I think that maybe um, the term shoe review might not be as accurate for... Okay. for our discussion today, uh, today and yeah. actually maybe even any time because we're we're kind of uh, sharing uh, some insight and in, in a story about shoes and rather their, than rather than saying they're good or bad and or uh, dealing with specifics of of midsole heights and and different uh, you know specific uh, specific characteristics about the shoes so okay. so we're it, it's it's more geared for uh, the functionality of the shoe and the matching or the compliancy of the shoe with a certain type of foot okay so just to kind of uh, have you guys listening know that that's more of our intent rather than actually giving uh, exact uh, you know measurements and, and things like that okay excellent so what now, so with that being said, what what are we discussing as far as this? Well, shoe talk? Uh, I have another question for you. Mm -hmm. um, you know the people that you have come in. Uh, you realize how many people uh, we see regularly with uh, relatively wide to extremely wide feet, also with very very flat arches that also have very neutral feet functionally. I don't know, but I'm going to throw out thirty percent. I, it's that's not bad really <laughs> yeah that's Sweet. it's or more made up statistics <laughs> or yeah. more okay and um, there are certain shoes uh, that will accommodate that type of foot the wider foot the flatter arch and the neutral foot definitely more so than other type of shoes and let me just delve into that a little well let me stop you there why don't I just get the same model I always get but just in a wide well the wide is in the front and maybe in the rear might be accommodating, but the key component here is the flat arch, uh, because okay. the flat arch is basically going to take in uh, or take up more surface area in this shoe. And this is this would be somewhat consistent with a traditional uh, contour of a, of your normal regular running shoe. It, but if I've got my foot is shaped that way, if your foot is shaped this way, and if it's if flat your foot or... shapes like my. Uh, and the other 30%. The other, yeah, the other. Uh, then what you're essentially going to have is the arch hanging over the midline or the waistline of the shoe in that fashion. That doesn't look very That's comfortable. That's not very comfortable okay. uh, for a number of reasons, functionally or to the person's uh, soft tissue. So obviously then what would happen if you had a shoe where it was just a little broader in that area? And that's the focus of our uh, shoe story today. Okay. You have uh, there. So, so we've got three models of shoes um, that we're going to show in this in this niche, if you will, or in this category or subcategory. Uh, the first one is the New Balance 840. That is correct. And so talk about that in respect to what you just mentioned. So in addition to getting a shoe uh, with a broader waistline, which accommodates uh, a wider foot, a i.e. and or a flatter arch, uh, you also derive, because of the, the shape of these particular shoes that we're going to be discussing, you also have a shoe that literally the whole platform and the footprint is a broader base, very similar to my sandal. And when you have that, you gain inherently a, a, um, a, a high level 
of what we call bilateral stability, meaning that the shoe is stable all the way around and can really actually accommodate various foot functions from a foot that has a small tendency to lean in or roll in. I, what, the, what you guys in the running community might know of as pronation, all the way over to a foot that actually is extremely efficient and stable and that might even have a little lateral inclination or outward um, or, landing. Or like what people would call a neutral runner foot. Yeah, highly neutral or even sometimes the term supination, but we okay. don't use those terms. But, but that, for people to understand what we're talking about. So a shoe with a broader platform, a broader, broader platform, a wider base is accommodating for a various uh, number of type of foot functions. Okay, so that would be one offering that, that might that might achieve that. And then the next offering would be the Brooks Dyad, also showing that wider Correct. midline. Correct, absolutely. And that's the common theme among the three shoes that we're going to be discussing. And so the differences of the three is going to be obviously the comfort, the fit, uh, you know, in other areas, uh, the actual feel of the shoe. So they're all three different shoes from three different, three different companies that are going to have uh, essentials of the company's uh, proprietary cushioning or, or other elements that make the shoe's personality unique to, to the company that may resonate with each customer. But where they're but consistent. The key, is that correct middle. exactly yeah. where they are have that common denominator is in this waistline the front uh width across and the and the heel width across actually could be very similar to a a traditional shoe but this is in this waistline area absolutely the the area that accommodates that foot so even between these models there can be a significant difference between the width here in the forefoot and the heel, even between these models. Absolutely. But where they're somewhat consistent is more right. mid, mid waistline, that where is the correct. arch is. And you're finding that a, a very important factor of getting, a huge of getting people fit. benefit of okay. getting people framed, mm -hmm. uh, the, the term that we have coined here at Fidipides, uh, to force us to look at the totality of the foot inside of the shoe to ensure that the shoe is within the borders or the boundaries of the shoe. Can I All ask, the way around, can I ask including the arch. Including the arch. <laughs> can I ask a question? Absolutely. Because uh, I've heard this a lot. You know, I, uh, a customer will come in and say, I have a really flat foot, and therefore I overpronate. Is Do you find that and it's not. consistent it's, Unfortunately, it's, it's, that's, that's an intuitive relationship between their brain and, and what they think should occur. And they also are being, that information is being reinforced, unfortunately, by... Uh, other consumer advocates and magazines and other stores and that if and the you medical, have a flat foot, correct, you, therefore they you are over, making that that connection, which but is we're an not, inappropriate connection. Uh, there is very little direct relationship between the morphological component of a foot, i.e., flat arch or high arch, and the mechanical characteristic of the foot. Sure. The foot moving. It's dynamic movement. It's dynamic or movement. Lack is, yes, has no direct relationship with the height of the arch and what we can expect in the function of the gotcha. foot. So we would still take a shoe like this that fit that person and frame that person. We wouldn't necessarily assume that they can't run in this because it's a, it still characterized as a neutral shoe, technically, by the different companies. Right. We would still watch them in that shoe right. and confirm the dynamic movement or lack thereof. Right. With all three of these, I, correct? All three, yeah. Okay. And so the next one uh, in that line is the uh, that that we carry is the Asics Fortitude, um, and again it using its proprietary gel component, but then also that that waistline or the Absolutely. midline being having that width. And again, would you say that all three are of equal quality? They're they're the they're the they're gonna. If, I mean, why would one choose this shoe over one of the other two? We, we, good question, and we did touch on that a little bit earlier, and that is that they all are going to have their own uh, distinct, unique personalities, meaning each company has a certain feel in the midsole that they try to derive. So whatever they uh, the feel upper, feels most correct. comfortable. Yeah. In the, if the person is... will definitely resonate with one of these based on uh, literally their foot inside of the shoe. And we will be checking to ensure that the arch area uh, is is absence of that hangover uh, because this part is going to be now more accommodating. Okay. 
All right. Is anything more to add about that? Uh, Not at sub, all. It's, I, well, yeah, and you said niche. Uh, it's only niche because very few companies address this, and we uh, have established this as one of our key um, uh, categories and have been for as long as I can remember. Uh, I'm realizing the need for that type for, of... For this specific for this subcategory. Specific subcategory. Gotcha. But because so it's there, significant enough. There's so many feet that are broader, uh, flatter arches, or just sure. broader that, re that really would benefit from that base. Uh, as opposed to um, putting them in a wide shoe uh, designated as a double E. So, or so for example, this shoe in, in a, a wide is going to e get you this, but you're not still missing give that. You right. Gotcha. Right. Okay. Well, you hear you heard it here, ladies and gentlemen. That's uh, that's in a nutshell our subcategory of what we call our balanced category or versatility category or bilateral, bilateral support yeah, anything that you come, yeah. come and ask for any one of those and we can probably figure <laughs> out what you want um but but just know that there's 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 specific things that 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 we'll be able to provide you for uh for you and uh, again on behalf of Thippities tv uh this is my colleague greg sheets and i'm kevin graham and uh thank you for watching Welcome everybody to Fidipides TV, episode three, on location at Fidipides with the Baron of Beer Miles, Rob Schuler. Rob, welcome. Thank you, Kevin. Great to be here. It's great to have you. So first off, we want to talk about what what is a beer mile? What constitutes a beer mile? Beer mile is the combination of two wonderful things, running and drinking. And it comes down to simply doing the following. Drink a beer, run a lap, drink a beer, run a lap, four beers, four laps. For a, mile. for a mile, and therefore a mile. So, is this is this usually reserved for adult runners? Uh, ideally, you need to be over 21. Uh, would never recommend anyone under 21, under legal age. Uh, you know, try this out. Of of course, of course, and of course, Fidipides does not absolutely does not adhere to it, we. I mean, we do adhere to all laws and regulations in the state of Georgia, or else or elsewhere for these type of activities. Uh, but what is the fastest beer mile that you have witnessed at a beer mile here in Atlanta? Well, there's a local legend, actually, for the Beer Mile here in Atlanta by the name of Matt Checkman, And I've seen on multiple occasions him hit a 630 Beer Mile. Uh, so so 630 for the, for, the, for the mile and the drinking. Exactly. That's, un that, that's unbelievable. We're not used to having a microphone, so it's going to go back and forth. <laughs> um, so, so have you seen a rise in Beer Mile participation with all the chatter that's been going on online and otherwise? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I'm actually having the fifth annual Fall Beer Mile Classic coming up uh, here in November. Uh, it started out as just a group of friends. Uh, now we're up over 40 plus people participating, even more coming out to spectate. I was going to say, the last time I went to a beer mile, there were more people watching than participating, which is not a bad thing. But can, can any of age adult do a beer mile? Oh, oh, absolutely. Uh, we have people coming out uh, that are even uh, in Grandmasters uh, category coming out. So, so one criticism that some people have is that they don't chug beer. Therefore, they don't think they can do a beer mile. Is that true? Uh, I mean, you know, sometimes beer is an acquired taste, uh, but, you know, it, uh, people take as fast as Matt Sheckman, 630, uh, to as long as 30 minutes. And, yeah, therefore, no, no chugging required if you're going for 30 minutes. Gotcha. Now, you don't usually get to participate in the beer mile because you're the race director. Does that bother you ever that you don't get to participate, or have you participated in your own beer miles before? Uh, I've been able to do it twice. Uh, yeah, I think my best time, my PR for the beer mile is somewhere a little over eight minutes. Uh, but, yeah, unfortunately, you know, with so many people participating, the popularity of the beer mile right now, it's a little bit difficult to do that and participate. Well, again, thank you very much for uh, tuning in with us. And again, this is the Baron of Beer Miles, uh, Rob Schuler. And if, if they wanted to participate, would there be any way of them participating here in Atlanta in a beer mile? Uh, absolutely. So the beer mile is uh, becoming more and more popular. But if you want to do a true beer mile, uh, the Saturday before Thanksgiving, Cheney Track down by Turner Field come out around 4 o'clock. Uh, and people will be uh, doing a beer mile for fun after our race season ends for the fall. So that's November 21st, correct? Correct, November 21st. 4 p.m. At Cheney Track. Okay. So the Beer Mile Atlanta, is, is there a website or is it all going to be Facebook at this point? Uh, there's a Facebook site page uh, that uh, you can go to, uh, to for more information. Excellent. Again, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Again, this is the Beer Mile Baron, uh, Rob Schuler, And everybody, good luck if you're doing it. And also... 
drink responsibly, and run responsibly. We are extremely happy and proud to announce we have our first guest. It's uh, Olympian, two-time Olympian, Alan Culpepper. Welcome, Alan. We Thanks. appreciate Thanks. having you. Thanks Thank you so much for taking your time. Uh, we're going to ask Alan a few questions. Some are some are going to be really, really easy. Some maybe not so easy. But for an Olympian, pretty much everything is easy. Uh, but we also want to talk about Alan's new book. It just came out, uh, Run Like a Champion. So we'll have links to that book, uh, how to how to order that book as well, and uh, and maybe even hold back some signed copies that we can ship to you guys. Um, but again, welcome, Alan. We appreciate your time. Um, the first question I'm going to ask is, um, which you, you also, as a two-time Olympian, you also coach people currently as well, right? I do, yeah, a little bit on the side. It's really to keep my, my foot in the door in terms of staying really connected to that, that okay. segment. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. That'd be a great coach to have. So my question, um, that, and you probably deal with this as a coach, would be if you had to give a novice runner one bit of advice as to how to improve, let's say a, a two fifteen half marathon or trying to break two hours for the first time. Um, what, if you could give them one kind of golden rule, what would it be? Yeah, I, I think a, a reoccurring theme I've seen with folks that are, they've already made that shift into, um, having a, having a goal they're working towards finding support through a, a group or some sort of uh, training group through a store or otherwise. Um, they've learned that it's more than just running every day or right. running four or five days a week. Right. Uh, they've learned that uh, you have to do a long run mm -hmm. of some nature. And um, what, what, would you, what would you characterize a long run to prepare for a half marathon for that person? Yeah, for what that person, you, you know, I'd run? say it's, it's 10 miles would be kind of your minimum, mm -hmm. you know? I don't think you have to necessarily run 15 miles if you're preparing, preparing for a half marathon, especially if the quality of that of long run is is of such where you're gonna actually get some nice aerobic benefit. Gotcha. If you're going super slow um, and chatting the whole time with your friends, then you would need to go longer. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I was always of the mindset of the long run was part of the, the weekly structure in terms of, it. I treated it like a session as it were. Sure. So if, if we're kind of categorizing that person who's who gets the basic principles and understands all the things that we're just, uh, what I was just sharing, I think the next step for them is longer intervals. Gotcha. I think so. It's where a lot of people miss the mark. They do tempo runs. Mm -hmm. um, almost most of their runs turn into tempo runs. Gotcha. Uh, most of their harder sessions, uh, whether they're in the group dynamic or if they're on their own, it's like we, they always can kind of go to the tempo effort. Sure. Which a lot of fart licks actually turn into tempo runs. Sure. Uh, because they're not mashing each interval. They're treating it all kind of these moderate efforts. You know, gotcha. where they're changing sure. pace. And then people will also get pulled into like more like speed work type workouts where it's right. like, well, we're all going to meet at the track and we're going to do some quarters. And, and so they're, they're touching on this, the uh, work that's quicker than race pace and they're mm -hmm. touching on the work that's slower than race pace, but they're not learning that, that fundamental element of being able to, to hold a fast pace, kind of that 10 K effort gotcha. for longer periods for four five, six, seven minutes. Gotcha. Okay. So I think so, that's, that would be my one piece. And, gotcha. that, and the reason why most people don't do them is because they're the hardest. Right. <laughs> they're, okay. They're yeah. uncomfortable. They are very uncomfortable. And so, so longer repetitions at a faster than say half marathon race pace, but also the long run, not neglecting those so yeah, kind of totally, two yeah. elements. Yeah. Okay. And there's, I mean, we could go into like <laughs> 15 <laughs> critical just call elements. Him. Just call him <laughs> yeah. and he'll coach you. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> or get the right. book. Right. Um, okay. Excellent. That's great. Um, okay, so the next question is going to be, um, what, what do you think distinguish you as an Olympian from people that, that were in your, in your kind of ability range? Um, what do you think distinguish you from, say, fifth place at the Olympic trials or tenth place at the Olympic trials? What, yeah. what would you attribute that to as an Olympian, two-time Olympian? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's an interesting question and, and things that I kind of go through in the book. And in terms of, like, as an athlete, what I was most proud of was not um, any particular like title per se, um, not even that, like make an Olympic team. Those aren't the things that I'm overall, if I'm say, if I just in my bedroom at night when I lay my head on the pillow, the things that I feel like I'm, I feel the most proud of is that I was able to year after year after year duplicate those performances and, and get better mm -hmm. and continually get better. Um, would you I, attribute that to lack of injuries or partially or just partially. smart training or yeah it's, both. it's i think lack of injuries is due to smart training gotcha. and, and lack of injuries is is not just a function of like well i was just genetically gifted because right. i was injured my first two and a half years of college okay and didn't i didn't run okay and so uh it's it's how you learn through that and how you learn to to make the necessary adjustments i think what distinguished me honestly was um my ability to really hone in on on 
what it what I really needed to do to achieve my goals, not just like theoretically. What you needed, what you needed to do physiologically. Yeah, and emotionally, like what, and okay. mentally, and okay. physically, in order to stay healthy. So you took over your own training to some degree. To is some that, degree, yeah. That... I think there's a there's an element of responsibility that you have to take on yourself, an onus there of of really learning how to be introspective, of like how you're feeling day to day. Mm -hmm. um, what you need to do to actually stay healthy and not just continue to push, push, push. It's not always about pushing. Um, and you always hear these things. It's, you know, it's not about training hard. It's about training smart and, and, you and have rest to, and, and you rest, rest and recovery yeah. Yeah. and all that stuff. You have to train hard. It's, it's, sure. it's part of it. Right. Um, that's an inherent trait of, of being successful in running, but it's also balancing that with how you, how you rest well and how you eat well and how you hydrate well. And, do you, do you have a really uh, fundamental stretching routine that, that will help you keep from getting little things turning into big things? Mm -hmm. I think that's what I did well. I just didn't, I didn't let little things spiral out of control. Gotcha. And I learned those lessons in college through okay. going through some disappointment. Did it, take, did it take time to get to that yeah, spot oh, where yeah, you were sure. managing your own... Your, your own energy, your own stretching, you, you, were, you were in a, in a system. Did it get you, did it yeah. take you a while to develop that system? Definitely, definitely. And that's, that's I think, I think that's a good way to put it. It's, it's a system, it's a routine, mm. you know, which I talk a lot about of having balance in the book where you have to learn this balance of how it all fits together with your life because they all become intertwined together. It's not mm. like you can just separate this thing where I went to the gym and I lifted weights and I'm done, you know, gotcha. or whatever. With running it, it's so intertwined with your lifestyle because it's your lifestyle affects how you feel in your running and vice versa. You know? Gotcha. Um, so those those were the things of balance, but also of of developing a, a consistent routine and developing a pattern to where you can really start to predict how you're going to feel. Mm -hmm. um, and those were the things that I, I think I did exceptionally well, and why I was able to continually just not have these big setbacks and miss a year and then so have that to work back. So consistent training and, and consistent improvement and consistent, yeah. you know, all the way Cons around. In mindset and all that, where it was never right. like, oh, I'm just going to take six months and kind of let myself off the hook. There was never a period where I was not continually focused on what I was con always working towards. Right, right. So. And that was eventually, you know, two-time Olympian, uh, 2000 in Sydney and then 2004 in Athens. Uh, 2000 is the uh, 10K right, um, yep. Olympian and then the, the marathon in 2004. So a wide range of ability there. Okay, so the, the last question I'm going to ask is maybe the most difficult. Um, and we may have missed the window to, to ask these questions, but in light of a lot of the things that are happening out in out in Oregon with the um, with the different Nike groups and, and other groups uh, with the with the idea of, of performance enhancing drugs PEDs and athletes possibly pushing the threshold um, of, of using those uh, but but yet not testing positive, um, I guess my question is, what is your opinion on those? I guess there's a couple of questions. Those that get caught with using PEDs, what do you believe the the, the, the sanction should be? Well, personally, I think the sanction should be a lifetime ban, like one time on, on the first you're defense. Done. Yeah, okay. that's my opinion, because there's an element there where, um, especially in if someone's taking steroids or something along those lines, where there's a muscular benefit that you've gained from that, mm -hmm. that even if you're off the, even if you're off of the, the whatever you were on, you've still gained that muscular benefit. Sure. There's a muscle memory there that you are always going to have sure. for the rest of your life. Um, the same way my wife was a gymnast as a child that developed a muscular strength and a responsiveness through her, muscul through her muscular development as a, as a child that she, even as an adult, still has that a responsiveness because she developed it, you know? Sure. So, so for me, that's, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty hardcore in terms of like, if you've made that choice to, to une make the playing field unequal, then you don't deserve to come back. Gotcha. Um, that, that's kind of where I stand on that. Sure. Um, I don't know how it works from a physiological standpoint, honestly, from a sign, like the scientific standpoint of how it works, like from aerobic, you know, aerobic mm, benefit. Sure. I do know that all of us that have trained at a higher level, you know, once you've achieved a certain level, it's much easier to get back to that. So sure. I don't know if the same would hold true if someone Some residual benefits. Yeah. I don't know if that would be the same. I would well, think what, it might. Well, I guess the, and, and that's, and that's almost like the black and white in a way, like, mm -hmm. you know, you get, you get, you get caught test, you know, tested positive for illegal performance enhancing drugs. Uh, but what about the gray areas? So you've got, mm -hmm. and the gray areas being, you, you can you can take substances that you do not then test positive for, but you have, you know, because there are thresholds within the IAAF rules. Uh, you can, as long as you're under the threshold of positive, you still remain a, a negative test. 
Um, so, so those that, um, again, Lance Armstrong never tests positive for any performance enhancing right. drugs, I believe. Um, but but the, the gray areas get a lot more tricky. Yeah. And that's, you know, people kind of call it gamesmanship or they call it, um, and some call it cheating. What, what, are, your, what are your thoughts on the, the gray area? But again, there's no way to, to prove it to, yeah. at, at right now. But Yeah, that's, that's where it gets so, so hard. And it really, at some level, unfortunately, comes down to personal choice. You know, mm. where, you, where you define that line. Because right. there's no way for us to, visit, to kind of go through this philosophical debate on it. Right. Because it could be... Um, folks from back in the 70s could say, well, Gatorade's performance in ANC, I would have died for Gatorade. Right, you know, that would sure. have made me a better runner, sure, you know, sure. um, or understanding anything about dietary or sure. hydration. Like when does that, that become a performance? Yeah. So it's like so thing, hard. To, yeah. And that's, you know, again, it's easy to sit back and be like, yeah, you know where the line is, but really there's, it's the lines get really blurred. Yeah, sure. There was a point where, you know, altitude tents were going to be banned by mm. IAAF. Sure. Because it was a synthetic See, version of the, of the real thing. Too, and someone sure. like myself living in Boulder, Colorado, I was like, yeah, it's harder to live here and train here than it is sure. to live at sea level and sleep in a tent. Sure. But is that, you know, that for me, that was the line. I wasn't willing to, to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't take any supplements because mm -hmm. it just it just wasn't how I was approaching it. You know what I mean? Sure, sure. So I don't know. I don't know if there's a good way to, to determine that. Sure. I do think a lot of it has been sensationalized, honestly. Sure. Um, as a as a high level athlete, I think the the ones you you know who's who's gone over that unethical line. Um, for me, it was real clear, and certainly wouldn't want to call anyone out because they didn't test positive. But it sure. wasn't Americans; it was sure. other athletes. That it sure. was just painfully obvious when I sure. was towing the line with these guys at World Championships or otherwise. I was like, oh, this is not fair. <laughs> like, right, right. I don't trust that yeah. that we're all on the same level. Sure, equal, sure. Same and for somebody like yourself, based on the statistics and the science, um, if you were to do a litany of, of PEDs, you could probably, as somebody as fast as you ran, could probably confidently say you were at, you would have been in a metal hunt. So oh, that, yeah, that, yeah. that makes it difficult yeah. you know, at, at, at the level you were at to not have a pretty firm stance on it all because it's, because I have a feeling for somebody like you, it was, it wasn't about money. It was more about yeah, the no. pursuit of the sport. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And as one of the first things I talk about, you have to understand your incentive why are you doing this? Like right. really deep down, why are you doing this? And for me, it was, I just wanted to see how good I could get, right. you know? Sure. And so that didn't line up with doing anything that was unethical. Like sure. It just, sure. it would negate the whole thing. You right. Know? Right. Um, it would be like having a, a stand in play the guitar for you and you right. claim right. that you're a unbelievable Which you're a pretty guitarist. good guitarist, correct? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for mentioning. <laughs> His band is actually playing tonight. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. Well, oh, that's excellent. That's an excellent point, especially about the uh, the PEDs. But but again, thank you very much for coming. And you guys, uh, if you get a minute, uh, pick up his book. It's it's new. It's called Run Like a Champion by Alan Culpepper, two time Olympian. Okay, so the last thing we'll cover is uh, we got a couple of events or a few events coming up. Um, Next week, Wednesday the 28th, we have our spooky run at uh, Philippity Sandy Springs at 6.15 p.m. So come dressed in costume, three-mile run through the cemetery and, and fun and dancing and music after that. Then Thursday, we have our uh, spooky run here at Philippity Zansley Mall. Same theme, a three-mile run in costume with prizes afterwards. Uh, fast forward to uh, November 1st at 11.01 a.m., we have the Ever Run for Everyone uh, with Saucony. Uh, it's it's going to be a 5K run. It's going to be a, actually a two two person team 5K run. Combined times age graded. Then we'll do trivia and a um, a field day game to decide the grand prize winners. So check that out on our Facebook page. And also we have uh, Brooks Adrenaline Sweet 16 for the GTS Adrenaline. Uh, that is November 7th, uh, time to be determined. But again, check our Facebook page for those um, and sign up before it sells out. Uh, but again, on behalf of my colleague, uh, Greg Sheets, I'm Kevin Graham. This is Fidipides TV, uh, and happy running. Thank you. Thank you.